Yeah, let's go. <laughs> one of the things that, and it's like I'm always saying, one of the things we got to do is we got to be able to figure out not only what's wrong, but we got to decide when we do find out what's wrong, what's the best course of action. Because we, we're concerned with our customers, we want to make sure that we don't spend more of their money. Like my, my niece uh, went to a shop in that far away, she lives way a long way from here. I mean, it would take me three days to drive to where she lives. And so she has this uh, Chevrolet Cruze, and it's making a whistling noise under the hood when the engine's running. Now usually when you see a whistling noise under the hood, it's basically, a lot of the times, when I say a whistling noise, it's like an air whistling noise when it's, just, when it's sitting there running. And a lot of times when you hear a whistling noise, it'll be because the PCV system, the, the closure hose is clogged up with something, and it's pulling air past this, the rear main seal and stuff, and when you pull the dipstick, the whistling noise will go away. This kind of thing, you know, so you basically have PCV issues with that. And, uh, but anyway, she went to, uh, now think about this, it's a 2007, uh, no, 2011 cruise, which is like a cobalt, right, pretty much. So she goes out there and they tell her uh, they want to put a valve cover gasket and a set of spark plugs in it and it's going to be $700. What's wrong with this picture? You can look up that vehicle and it just pays like 1.4, even if you've got the turbocharged engine. You see what I'm saying? And even if they're replacing the whole valve cover, which is $154, plus the labor it takes to do it, I can't find $700 there anywhere. And, uh, and that was at a dealership, you know, where they ought to know what the labor time is. I don't understand how that kind of thing works or why it works that way, but anyway. Uh, so, this is a 98 F-150 with a 4.6 liter engine skip. Oh yes, by the way, I forgot. Here is your, uh, here is the test that you're going to take. Oh, great. So I'm going to pass that out and all that. And everybody gets one of those. That's a test. Everybody's got, and this is fill in the blank now. Most of them are not. I'm doing give, all Give favorite. Noah one, too. Noah needs one, too. Noah's all Noah can't have one. All right. Give Noah one and give everybody one. My hands are like the dirtiest ones I ever want. Right. Kayla will have to do that, too, whenever she needs it. All right. Take them. Okay, this one has plug wires, not call pack. It's got a PO305 diagnostic trouble code. So where do we start? PO305 diagnostic trouble code. Where do we start? What is that? Where is that? Code There you go. I can't believe that you asked that question. A PO305 is an engine skip on number five cylinder. Okay, that's what a PO305 is. That's it. He's got to do a whole trouble code sheet this long with 600 trouble codes so he can understand. See if this gets an intermittent. Memorize your trouble code so it'll appear. Okay, that's how you do it. I'm just kidding. Um, where do we need to start? Number five was the dead hole. The injector was clicking, there was spark there, and the spark plug didn't look greasy. If the spark plug's greasy, it means it hadn't been firing typically. Now, a lot of times when you see a greasy spark plug on a misfiring cylinder, it doesn't mean that the spark plug is greasy causing the misfire. A lot of the times it means the spark plug is greasy because it's been misfired. And the plug can be the reason or it can be something else. You know, with the obvious out of the way. Now, we can also check for injector flow. That's, that's a little troublesome. I mean, you can do it. And uh, we've actually found some misfires checking injector flow. Didn't you do that on one? I can't remember. I was thinking one of y'all. They checked the injector flow and found that was on the escort, wasn't it? And the injectors weren't flowing because, you know, the, I guess it had enough credit fuel going through them. And we took some uh, injectors off of a Dodge truck that happened to be configured the same way and put those on there. And the escort ran a lot better with those Dodge truck injectors on it. But anyway, uh, the pounds per hour was off because the injectors were pink instead of gray, but whatever. Uh, anyway, Webb and Kelly came to my office and they said, I put my PSI service based sunglasses on. And I said, this is what I want you to do. Get a compression gauge, screw it into that hole, and let's see how far that number five will push the needle. I'm going to spin it over for at least six pups. And see how far it's going to push that needle up there, right? Okay, so I heard them cranking the engine over. You could tell that one of the cylinders was picking up speed, wasn't squeezing air. Even when it all the plugs were in it, when you spin it over, you could tell it would go, whoa, 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 like one of them wants squeezing air. That basically means you got low compression on one cylinder. Uh, and I knew which one it was because five was the one that skipped it. The cause of the dead cylinder needed to be further pinpointed, and we needed more data. Sometimes you just got to gather more data. And uh, how many times do you go to somebody who would have a, an overheating vehicle or something like that, and they'll say, uh, 
Blown head gasket. Penny check method. Penny molten hood. Blown head gasket. That's why it's blown head. Or there's one lady went over there with her little 3.1 uh, to a shop uh, somewhere in another town, and uh, it had water in a wall. It was like that Pontiac out here, the little Pontiac we got, the little white Pontiac. Water in a wall. And so they said, oops, you're going to have you know, an engine, head gaskets, whatever. And so she came and asked about it. And uh, though those particular ones, if you're familiar with them, the intake gasket blows and it gets water in the wall. So we put an intake gasket on it and took care of her problem. <laughs> but I mean, she didn't need an engine, she didn't need head gaskets, she just needed an intake gasket. See what I mean? So long and short of it is you can just throw a diagnosis at one and just, you know, but you need to verify too. Uh, anyway. All right, so after the six puffs, the needle pointed to 70 pounds of compression. That's all we had, and obviously that's not enough. All the rest of them had a lot more. On overhead cam engine, you know, it needs to be a lot better than that. So if you've got four valve engine, if you've got an overhead cam four valve engine, it's typically going to have, you know, over 200 pounds of compression. If it's a just a two valve engine that's got the camshaft in a block, usually you're going to wind up seeing about 160, 175 pounds. Those are, those are foggy numbers, but you see where I'm going with that. We find TDC compression stroke on that cylinder into a cylinder leakage test. So how do we find TDC compression stroke on cylinder number five? Anybody know? Not theory. just TDC, it needs to be TDC compression stroke because that piston comes up two times in a full cycle. So you need to make sure you're on the right stroke or you'll get bad reading. All right, so tell me how we do that. Make All sure right. you're on top this area with valves, compression, and the fresh, the fresh valve's got to be, yeah, be closed, right? Closed. How do you know? Because you've got a completely assembled engine here, you don't have a valve curve off. That's pretty dicey, isn't it? All right, so what is the companion cylinder for cylinder number one? Got any idea? Six. All right, let's back up a little bit. Let's say that we can find the, the uh, eight. we find TDC, huh? Eight. Eight. Really? Eight. Five. Eight. Probably six. How do I know it's I six? I said six first. He's like, me. I didn't hear that. <laughs> did not just say six. Did he, did he say six? I said six when I first said it. I didn't hear it. You probably had the, that NOS can in your mouth and said it. All right, so you got... Uh, one, Thank three, seven, two, six. The one that's uh, right here, you know, you got the break these down in fours, the first one in that second group of four, or if you put a, if you pretended it had a distributor. The next one by it. The, no, it's the one across from it. Yep. See? It's going to be the one across from it. That's what it's going to amount to if it's a distributor. Long and short of it is, if you found on this one here, cylinder number three compression stroke. There's a couple of ways you can do this. Cylinder number three, let's say you find a compression stroke on cylinder number three. If cylinder number three is on compression, its companion is number five, right? You notice three and five are fired by the same coil? That's what these coil packs work like. So if I find compression on three, where is five? Top dead center compression on three. Exhaust. Exhaust, exactly. And so if I find compression on three, how many degrees do I need to turn the crankshaft before I know I'm at top dead center compression on five? Do I go one full turn? Should. One full turn puts me on compression on five, doesn't it? Because mm -hmm. it's gone down and it's come back up. All right, so anyway, we found it. Basically, knowing how to find that is really important. All right, so and this is what we were talking about here. But we've also got an IPA tools calibration setup kit. That's pretty handy, too. See that little whistle? When you put that in that hole and you bump it over, it whistles. And that's the way you can find it on three. Okay, here I go. You can still find it on five that way because you've got 70 pounds of compression. 70 pounds of compression is going to blow the whistle, right? And then you've also got these other things right here. Let me show you. They're like uh, this whistle. What are we going to do? When the whistle tweets, the cylinder's coming up with the valve closed. Now, that got us to the right stroke, but we needed a TDC that piston helps the air we were about to apply. If it's not on top dead center and you apply air with the valves closed, that air level will push the crankshaft by turning by pushing the piston, right? So you got out on TDC where it where it's just pushing straight, it's not pushing on one side of the crank or the other. 
Spring number five to exactly TDC. We put this little spring loaded IPA uh, TDC finder and brought the piston squarely to the top of the travel. Something else that you might see somebody do on a four cylinder engine to make sure that they know where the pistons are, whether they're TDC or not, they get these big stiff tie wraps, take all the plugs out, and just stand them on top of the pistons. And then as you're turning it through, you'll see those tie wraps, you know, going up and down so you can tell what's where. All right, we found just under 70% cylinder leakage using this. Incidentally, there's a worksheet on this. Uh, should have been a lot less than, than that much. That's a lot of cylinder leakage. 70% compression, 68% leakage. We had a PO305. These three pieces of data were basically telling us we've got low compression. It's going somewhere. We needed to see where the leakage was going. It was at this point that we became unorthodox in our troubleshooting. So what I did was I said we ordinarily use some listen exercises. We'd listen to the exhaust. We'd listen to the intake. We'd listen to See if there's bubbles in the coolant, we see if it was going out the crankcase, that way we know. Now incidentally, if we do, uh, we find 70 PSI on that cylinder and we squirt some motor oil in there and we spin it up and it comes up to about a whole bunch more, we know we got piston ring issues, right? If it doesn't come up, we know we got valve issues. The piston rings are sealed somewhat by the oil whenever you put a little oil in there. Um, so what we decided to do here was get our handy dandy smoke machine, take that cylinder leakage tester off and pump smoke into that cylinder and see where the smoke came out. See, the smoke's going to follow the path that it takes to get fine atmosphere. All right, so pumping smoke into the cylinder through the leak tester, we found it making its exit into the intake. What does that mean? We had an intake valve that wasn't sealing. Okay, and see if you had a starter that would spin backwards and what's wrong with this. Would the engine run? Engine wouldn't run backwards. Usually, if you turn the engine backwards, it puts it out of time. If it's one of these with a the timing chain and then tensioners, if you turn the engine backwards, you're going to screw it up. In a I lot was, of cases. I just wanted. To, I was thinking about like, yep. what if you crank it up, you know, just spin it backwards. No, you can't crank. Well, I mean, if you're pushing the air in it, it can push it backwards, but it ain't going to crank backwards. You got to have a different camshaft in there if you want that to happen. But that's another story. Some marine engines have got different timing marks. For, with different, you know, if you want to run the engine to the left instead of the right, you know, you'll actually put the time and march on a different mark. But that's that's a totally weird thing that we don't fool with in automotive. We need to consider the cost of whatever we decide to do. This is a 200,000 mile truck. What do you think? Smells like a dog on the inside, no fun to drive. It's an old truck, like the one Katie's got. You know. Charles is worse than mine. Yeah, Charles Aye. is worse than mine. Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, Sideline, eight digit six or eight digit W. That's going to tell us what we got. That's what the salvage yard needs to know. Uh, eight digit six. Now, this, I don't understand why they've done this. It's a eight digit six or W. If it's a six, it's a Windsor. If it's a W, it's a Romeo. Why didn't they make a W a Windsor? Why didn't they make a W a Windsor? Come on. The two engines look almost just alike, but there's differences. The Romeo engines have a different head design in regard to the camshaft. See the difference in the way these look? The Romeo's got a slightly different timing guide, chain guide set up. The Windsor has more valve cover bolts than the Romeo. The Windsor also uses the dowel set up to set up the main cap. So if you're if you're looking at the engine, you will not be able to just glance at that engine and tell it's a different motor. What's yours? Is it a Romeo or a Windsor? I don't know. Don't know. You put spark plugs in it yesterday. You can't tell just looking at it unless you're really sharp and you know exactly what to look for. You probably aren't going to be able to pick it out. If the intake valve had been totally open, 100% leakage, some exploratory surgery might have been ordered to check for a broken valve spring. You've got a broken valve spring and it's just hanging open, might be able to change the valve spring. This one ahead would be a candidate for a valve job, and that's a pricey repair. Time and chain kits, gaskets, and everything else puts this repair pretty high. The used engine might be in order. If we weren't planning on using the truck for another 20 years, so I called LKQ and they priced me a motor out for $650. That's pretty cheap, isn't it? How much you pay for the motor we got for your trailblazer? 450. $450. Well, you can get a good good deal sometime. You know, like that. I will find me a 4.3. 4.3? Yeah. Those are obsolete. Nobody uses those anymore. Oh, man. Okay. All right. We had earlier replaced a radiator and repaired the AC on a Chrysler 300, but now the 300 had pushed its temperature needle high, and it had a leak in water pump. Water coming when you got water coming from behind the water pump, believe you got a bad seal in there. This one got a timing belt and a water pump. 
And then time to belt on that one up there. Belt the changes, to change to different things. We had a transmission swap underway on a PT cruiser and needed to look for overheating problem. That one happened too. Now, incidentally, a PT cruiser, typically when a PT cruiser starts to overheat, the fan likes to go bad on those things and the radiator likes to stop up for some reason. My, my neighbor across the road, his daughter drives a PT cruiser like that. It's about time you got there. Forgot my before. I was locked up my house. You're three shop. hours late. I know I am. <laughs> Give her an answer sheet. Yeah, you did. Okay. Huh? Yeah, there you go. All right. So the lady across the road, he said, my daughter's uh, a PT cruiser is uh, overheating, and uh, we've done enough of those in here. You know, nobody knows all the answers. And I said, if you just want to take a wild shot at that, and you're paying for it anyway, put a thermostat, a radiator, a fan in it, and you'll probably take care of the problem. So they put a thermostat, a radiator, and a fan in it. Bring Katie up to, I mean Katie, bring Kayla up to the feet. What are we doing? Somebody give her, you got uh, 20 words or less. What do we got going here? Anybody know that? Maybe we got what? a truck misfiring on cylinder number five. We found top dead center cylinder number five. We did a cylinder leakage test. And we found out that it was leaking. <laughs> we put smoke in there where the cylinder leakage tester was after we pulled it off. It came out the intake. We found out we had an intake. Huh? That is more, more than 20 words. I realized as I said 20 words, that wasn't going to make it. But uh, you count the words that fast, you're pretty impressive. I would. Yeah. Anyway, long and short of it is, that's where we're, I'm trying to bring uh, Kayla up to speed since she's two hours late. All right. So, we also troubleshot a, 19, a 2007 Altima with a delayed reaction blower motor issue. He start the car and for five minutes the blower was inoperative and then it would come on. Five minutes he had no blower and then the blower would kick in. Five minutes. Parts girl, you should be able to know the answer to this one. All right. We duplicated that concern quite easily. This is a voltage check and we transposed the potted blower and debug relays and the all went away. They didn't relay, were just alike, so we just swapped them around from one way. The potted relay is looks like this. You see that relay right there? It's potted. Don't yawn. Yawn is bad. <laughs> you had that time to get sleepy again. All right, you see that one right there? These right there are very similar. But that one's not potted. You can pop the cover off of that one and look inside of it. This one here has kind of got some electronic stuff inside of it, just like transistors or whatever. Uh, they got the same pin out, but that's normally closed terminal. But these like to die that way. They like to die. Them potted relays, they die in a peculiar fashion. Sometimes they work, sometimes they won't. These are usually dead. You know, they can go either way. Those die in a peculiar fashion. Well, the F-150 owner called back and opted for the LKQ lift, and the real adventure started. We put the engine in. It's not for a lazy uh, wimp or a faint-hearted. You know what I'm saying? If you're going to put a motor in one of these trucks, or in a Crown Victoria, or in just about any car, you got to be somebody that will stay on task, get the job done. If you're not willing to do that, you need to be doing something else. All right, Willie got the engine installed, but we had to buy a $30 eight bolt flywheel from a local salvage yard because the original engine had a six hole crankshaft and the original flywheel wouldn't fit. So I called the salvage yard and said, what the heck is we got a six bolt flywheel and an eight bolt engine you brought us over here? What's up with that? And I said, is that, it's not a Romeo versus Windsor thing? He said, no, it could be either way. You may have a six bolt, you may have an eight bolt, you just need to get your flywheel. Oh, thanks, you know, that was wonderful. That's what it looked like. This is what we pulled out, this is what we're trying to put back. Flywheel's not going to work until you get a flywheel. So I went by the salvage yard and picked up a flywheel. And so the replacement engine was in place. We found it spinning with almost no compression along with intermittent backfiring through the intake. At least the other one would start running. This one here popping back through the intake, giving it all kind of problems. So, uh, hey, see the cap at the bridge of his head? This was a revolting development. All right, so good salvage parts companies start the used engines they're planning to sell while the engine's still in a vehicle. Now, at uh, Fulford's and Enterprise, what they would do for years and years, I don't know if they still do this, when they pull it, when they would pull the engine out, they'd start it, make sure it ran like it was supposed to. When they pull it out, they pull all the plugs and they shoot a little shot of transmission fluid down in the spark plug holes. And then they put the plugs back in and put it on the shelf inside the building. You got it? That's really smart because it keeps it from getting rusty in there, okay? Well, anyway, sometimes we checked and rechecked the spark plug wire route, measured the compression, found it's at one cylinder with 99 psi and 40 to 60 on all the other ones. Adding oil to the cylinder didn't do anything to improve the compression. What's wrong with it? What's it got to be, y'all? Out of time. They turned the darn thing backwards whenever they were taking the torque converter bolts out. If you do that on one of these, it's going to screw it up. 
or if you do it on any engine. If you've got an engine on the lift and you've got your, uh, your breaker bar on the uh, crank pulley, don't turn that engine backwards because you're liable to create a problem you didn't have when it came in there and then it's on you. You got me? Always turn it the way it, if it's a, if the engine's in the car backwards, it's going to turn counterclockwise. If it's in the car, you know, the right way, no, not on a sideways engine. If the timing belt's on the driver's side of the car, it's going to turn counterclockwise. If the timing belt's on the passenger side of the car, it's going to turn clockwise. But always turn it the same way it runs whenever you're turning it over. Don't take a chance on that. That's like, don't put your finger in here on one of these electronic throttle bodies. Don't put your finger in here. Well, particularly when you need your neck, could have cut your finger off. But secondly, don't do this. Don't open that throttle body with your finger. You know why? You may wind up having to buy a throttle body. Drew did that on his Jeep. Pushed that thing open with his finger, cleaned it up, comes back whining about his throttle body, throwing code. I said, you open it with your finger? Yeah. Did I tell you last semester not to do that? Yeah. Now you got to buy a throttle body, okay? All right, somebody could probably turn this one backwards during the process of unbolting the torque converter. All right, so he get he gritted his teeth and he pulled that sucker back out. And they sent us another engine. Didn't charge any more. After the people that I called, you know, the, the technical people I called, I said, look, this is what happened. This is what we're reading. This is what the deal was. And uh, anyway, long and short of it was, it also had an 8-volt crankshaft like the first one that they sent us, so we were able to use our $30 flywheel. All right, so expect to earn what you get paid. I don't get paid anything. Expect to earn what you get paid. There will come a time for you. All right. You know what you're getting paid right now? No attention. No, you're getting paid. Uh, well, are you too broke to pay attention? But anyway, what you're getting paid right now is the work you're doing on your truck means that your truck will be back in the wind with the new harmonic balancer. Ring. His harmonic balancer came apart. The you know the outside ring came off of the rubber, <laughs> and he goes to the parts store to buy a harmonic balancer. What did they tell you? They told me. I pulled up, pulled up and said, I need a harmonic balancer for that truck out there. He said, there ain't no way in there. He cussed at me a little bit. And he said, there ain't no way you going to drive it up here with a harmonic balancer broke. I said, but I kind of did. <laughs> <laughs> that may have been the guy that, that messed the wiper blades up. Do you think? Is that yeah. O'Reilly's? Yeah. yeah. No, a different guy. Okay. Geneva. Anyway, real life, some of them, I'm going to tell you, some of them people, the old guy. Some of them people oh. think they know more than they do. It's just yeah. all there is to it, you know? All right, realize that some jobs don't go well. Yeah, who in here? Who in here has done a repair job on a customer's car that didn't go well? All right. The most recent one, we put the condenser in that Cherokee, cooling really good, comes back the next day, no juice in it. That didn't go well, did it? All right. So we got to figure out where the juice is getting going to. All right. Take responsibility when you make a mistake. Back when I was working at. Uh, down in Texas, uh, I was driving this big pipe loader because I was having to pull a forklift out of the bog. I was in a maintenance department. Big pipe loader, it had tires that were so big you couldn't roll them through that door. I mean, it was a big giant thing. It had these forks on it to pick up pipe. And so uh, I was pulling that, watching the forklift back there because I was worried about what was going on behind me. And when I drove that thing forward, the forks went into the dirt and busted a water line. And it came. And so I went to the maintenance supervisor and I said, hey man, I messed up. I was watching where the forks was. They went into the dirt. He said, well, that's a breath of fresh air. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, anytime anybody else screws something up right here, they don't say, I messed up. They say, it wasn't my fault. And all I hear is, not my, not me, not me, you know. But anyway, I was just telling him, I'm the one that did it. I was sitting behind the wheel. I was the one not paying attention to where the forks were. I messed up, you know. Share your knowledge freely. The more you share, the smarter you'll get. That doesn't mean to tell somebody that they couldn't drive up here with their balancer broke. That was not sharing knowledge. That was, you know, exhibiting somebody that didn't really know what they were talking about. Show up at work early. Right? I show up early. Right? Every day. right? Show up at work she early. Like... Don't leave early. Work early. <laughs> Get a lot of work done. And when you're headed to the parts room, you need to be walking like you're late for an appointment. You need to be moving. If they see you walking around a shop with your hands in your pockets or sitting in your car vaping, they're not going to be happy with you, okay? All right. Ignore the people around you who complain. Don't be a whiner. Don't pay attention to people that complain because if a lot of people, if it's, it's infectious. You know what I mean? When somebody's complaining, everybody starts complaining. It's just, you, if your atmosphere will start to stink, if you make it stink, 
and then everybody wants to just keep their arm, you know, or if, if there's somebody that likes you, they'll start complaining too. They'll think, the problem is not with me, it's with this place, you know. They aren't making things better for anybody by planning it. Don't lie or steal. I broke that one. I took a screwdriver home, but I broke it back. You didn't do it on purpose, though. No. You didn't say, I'm going to take a screwdriver home. Mine. <laughs> Put it in your pocket. <laughs> mine, all mine. <laughs> I did yeah. it with an extension, too. Well, I don't know at the times I went home and pulled, reached in my back pocket and put my wallet yeah, out and a 5 16 wrench comes yeah, out. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's just part of it. And somebody has got my red pocket screwdriver. Who was it? This is another one I had, the one that I was I using. I think you left it over there on that little stand. Well, I'm glad I didn't leave it under the hood of that car we were wondering. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's the end of that. Now, have you finished your test? No. Good luck. You should be able to finish your fill in the blank test now. I can't remember what you said. Pay what does pay stand for? I know you told me. Go Performance, over. attitude, integrity, dependability. Paid stands for performance, attitude, integrity, and dependability. You That's get paid I mean. by having all four of those. If you've only got three of those, you're not going to do well and you probably won't get paid much. You said independable? I'm going to fix my truck. All right, hold on a second. Okay, you missed two, seven, five, three, and ten. I, no, I, oh, I missed a bunch of them. No, I didn't. Yes, put, put down the answers you remember and put them up here on my teaching desk. Okay, that'll be good.